Hi everybody, welcome to this National Story of Ukraine Part 2. Although, actually this is the third video, <laughs> but this is a Part 2. So, um, as I mentioned in the previous videos on Ukraine, um, I'm just hitting the highlights. This is an incredibly rich, deep topic. Uh, I don't want to repeat all this again. We could spend a whole semester on this. Um, but we got things to get to. <laughs> Now, one thing I do want you to mention, I mentioned this in the first lecture too, um, a lot of the themes that we'll see following are very important for what we're doing in our 20th century Europe class. Um, now, obviously, we're in Ukrainian history, we're going back much, much farther. In fact, we've gone back to the ancient world. Um, in this lecture, we'll get up a little more closer to the modern world. Um, but what you see taking place here is going to resonate in things we'll discuss in class, which is what is the national origin? And there's so many complex interactions, formation of identities, um, the struggle of powers over geography, culture, religion, um, a place in the sun, the, the copy of a German phrase from the, the rise of the German Empire, um, and, and how that and how different versions of that are going to impact all the nations we're going to talk about this semester. Um, so even though in this Ukrainian history class we're going back much farther, um, in all the nation and national stories we're going to talk about in the class as we get into the 20th century, of course, and you guys know this well, there's a backstory for all of those. Uh, and to really understand the context of the time and decisions they made, and their agency in navigating the complex world around them. And of course, there's a long backstory for each of those nations. So the fact that we're starting with Ukraine is, is helpful because kind of going back in time and analyzing their formation as a people and a culture, I would be played out in all the nations we're talking about in class, even though in our class, uh, we're not gonna do this for most national groups. We're not going this far back in time because we're focused on the 20th century. But just, it's always so important to keep in mind um, there's a l much longer backstory, and that explains much of the present world and the context is vital. So, okay, with that little uh, <laughs> with that little aside, let's jump back into where we left off. We were talking about ancient Kievan Rus when we left off, and uh, let's pick up right there. So, uh, in, that case, in this case, we're going to talk about introduction of Christianity into the lands today, which would be the Ukraine. In, the, in this case, in the context. Uh, of this time period would be Kievan Rus and how profound that is going to be in influencing what takes place in today we know as Ukraine. And this is on many levels, but this profound cultural transformation and tied to larger Western world. And the piece of artwork you can see in front of you is a depiction of uh, the two most important national identity figures, uh, by the way, not just national, pan-national, to the Slavs, which is a depiction of St. Cyril and Methodius, who in the eyes of most of the Slavic peoples, and in in that's primarily Eastern Europe, they see that these two gentlemen as bringing Christianity, but as you see depicted in this artwork, it's Christianity, but it's also literacy. It's the word, and it's the origin of, of the Cyrillic alphabet, which is the alphabet of much of Eastern Ukraine. Although that, in Ukraine, in Russia, those different versions of Cyrillic, but their origin of literacy is thanks to these two gentlemen depicted right in front of you, Cyril and Methodius. Um, they are, again, heroes for much of Eastern Europe. You can go to many European countries from Czechoslovakia and <laughs> yeah, Ukraine, obviously, Russia, Belarus, etc. And, uh, and beyond that, I, I just mentioned a couple of them. Vast swaths of Eastern Europe see these two men as great national heroes bringing with them a spiritual faith system, Christianity, of course, but also means literacy and the window to the world of knowledge in the Western world that literacy brings, and well, and even more specifically, the very alphabet which they write with today. Although the alphabet designed by Cyril Methodius, of course, was an early version that will develop into a modern version of Cyrillic, which is used uh, throughout Eastern Europe today. Now, there are earlier origins. By, by the way, if you're wondering, so when did Cyril Methodius, when is their arrival in the lands of Ukraine in, in Eastern Europe? Um, and that is going to be, here we go. <laughs> We're getting there. Uh, it's going to be uh, in the 800s. 
is when they arrived there. By the way, sorry for that whiplash there, me scrolling through my notes there. But <laughs> I'd remind myself, it's been a very busy day. That would be in the 800s. But let me more slowly scroll back for you guys. Um, but there are earlier origin stories of when Christianity may, we'll put the big may, according to certain legends, that Christianity may have arrived in the area perhaps of Crimea and those, uh, those regions, because Crimea had been part of the very far fringe of the Greek empires, um, and it was a, a Roman province. So according to Christian tradition, Christianity actually arrived in the lands of Ukraine prior to Cyril Methodius. In fact, uh, about 900 years earlier, and this would be according to the belief that St. Andrew, and let me highlight that for you guys, the belief that St. Andrew would introduce, there we go, would introduce uh, Christianity into the lands of today, which we know as Ukraine, which was part of the Roman Empire in that era. And that would be, well, his life was circa 5 AD to 60, 70 AD. We don't know exactly. But in the Ukraine national memory, and you have to be careful of that term, because again, some of this could be, uh, we'll put this in the big maybe category. But that St. Andrew actually is the first one to bring Christianity to the land of Ukraine. But because of all the devastation, the end of the Roman Empire, uh, a whole series of barbarian invasions of lands you know of Ukraine, the Christian hold is largely lost. For those who had converted, it's largely lost, again, according to this thought system. So Cyril and Methodius, when they arrive in the 800s, uh, are reintroducing, again, according to this view, reintroducing Christianity, and at that point, there'll be mass conversion over time in Kiev and Rus, and... Uh, and that will bring Christianity to much of Eastern Europe. So St. Andrew, about 800 years earlier, perhaps he had planted seeds of Christianity, and maybe they weren't entirely extinguished, but all the warfare and chaos of the fall of the Roman Empire and all the displacement by various peoples of various, you know, the Huns, many people go through the area today, it would be Ukraine and Crimea. Um, perhaps that the Christian footprint had been largely lost. And so it would be Cyril Methodius who reintroduced it. But when they introduce it, it brings up a larger uh, topic, which is the influence of Byzantium Empire in the lands that we know today as Ukraine. And so why is that so significant? Because Byzantium, as you guys are well aware, most of you, many of you guys are history majors, but you don't have to be. <laughs> uh, but the Byzantium Empire is a continuation of the Roman Empire in the East, mixed with Greek culture. So it's both Latin and Greek culture mixing together, and that's the Byzantium Empire. And what that means is a very highly sophisticated, literate, cultured, scientifically, technologically advanced society, which is Byzantium, and their connection with what today would be the lands of Ukraine. And that is coming in the form of Cyril Methodius, but they're, they're bringing, as they're bringing literacy and Christianity, they're bringing a part of Byzantium, even though Byzantium is not really going to control well, a little bit, but they're not really control much of the Ukraine. But again, introducing a, a connection point to a sophisticated culture. And that piece you see in front of you, piece of artwork, is from the great uh, Christian church today, currently mosque, the Hagia Sophia, and shows Virgin Mary holding the Christ child in her lap, and Justinian, the greatest of all the Byzantium emperors, um, on one side and the other side offering the Hagia Ecclesia, this magnificent church, the greatest probably church in Christendom, at least in the Eastern world, depicted right here. And back to this map here. So let me show you this little map right here. So if you look carefully, you will see that uh, Byzantium at the height of its power did claim the very southern portion of Ukraine. I'm sorry, of well, it would be Ukraine because that's the Crimean Peninsula. Now, obviously, clearly, the Byzantium footprint in the, the larger geographic Ukraine is quite minimal. But the fact that they do a, a toehold there, again, by the way, that's connected again to the, the great breadbasket of Ukrainian agriculture because they're importing grain from there as well, too, just as the ancient Athens of Greece did, the Romans did, now the Byzantium Empire is doing it. And their interest in this region uh, as Christians prompts the... The Patriarch of Constantinople to dispatch missionaries to the pagan Slavic peoples. In this case, think the Kingdom of Rus and other areas too, but uh, dispatch them. And by the way, there's the Hagia Sophia there in front of you. 
And there's uh, one of the great iconic masterpieces of uh, Christian mosaic from Byzantium era there, the depiction of Christ there in the Hagia Sophia, which is uh, as it is today, although you can see it's been damaged. So that's the arrival of Cyril Methodius dispatched by the Patriarch of Constantinople to convert the Slavs, again, many of them would be in U Ukraine, uh, to uh, Christianity. So what does this mean? And make sure you guys get this down. And hold, let me actually, I'm going to add this right now on the fly. There we go. <laughs> uh, let me see. And let me highlight that. There we go. And this to Cyril Methodius, evangelist to Slavs. So obviously Christianity comes with it and the whole ethical worldview that comes with that. But make sure you guys write down the other things that come with this. It means a, a sense of identity. Again, part of the, the Christian perspective of who you are in the universe. Um, scholarship, cultural ties to the art of the Slavic peoples. And they're tying them to the larger world of Byzantium. And that means, again, that means, it means literacy, access to high-level technology, science, literature, uh, much of the classical greco roman world, which would have been extinguished, even though the Greece had been there, Rome had been there too. But for the most part, because of all the warfare and dislocation of barbarian groups, that had largely been lost. But reintroducing that connection to the larger classical Western world is now reintroduced into the lands of uh, Eastern Europe in general, but in this case, specifically Ukraine. Let me show you a contemporary example of this. When I say contemporary, it means this photograph was taken probably in the last six or seven months. A depiction of a, a monument in Kiev. The top of it is Princess Olga. This is the mother. I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure. I think I believe that's the mother of uh, Vladimir, which is the, 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 the Kievan prince who will be baptized, convert to Christianity, uh, and following his conversion, there'll be mass conversion in Kievan roots. But according to, I believe, uh, is actually Princess Olga beforehand who converted first, and that Vladimir would eventually convert as well, too. Now, who are the other people in this? That would be Prince Andrew. I mentioned, I'm sorry, Apostle Andrew, right here. Again, depiction the, the earliest contact to Christianity according to tradition. And but we're not dismissing that. That could be true. We don't know. We'll put that in the big maybe category. That perhaps uh, Andrew not long after the time period of Christ, would have could have journeyed on a, on a missionary journey all the way to today would be the Crimean Peninsula, bring Christianity with him in that in the context of the Roman Empire of that era. And then our two heroes of the moment, Cyril Methodius, who are depicted right here, uh, reintroducing and reconnecting the lands of Kiev and Eastern Europe with the, the classical Western world in the form of Byzantium and the Western world in the form of Byzantium. And, of course, you see them sandbagging it because there's a war going on, as you guys know, a terrible war. And they want to preserve this cultural heritage, in this case, uh, this important statement of who they are as a people, this great introduction of uh, of culture, learning, spiritual thought systems, etc. Now, by the way, almost many of the statues, especially Sir Methodius, you'll find them also in Russia. Many other places in Eastern Europe, too. So they're universally, this lot of people viewed them as great, great, grand heroes. And there's two brothers, Cyril Methodius, two Byzantium Christian monks, theologians, missionaries, obviously very talented too, because they could come up with, let me highlight that for you guys, uh, what's called the Golgothic alphabet, which is the predecessor of the Cyrillic alphabet, which is the alphabet of much of Eastern Europe today. And in the context of our class specifically, it's a precursor of mo the modern Ukrainian alphabet. Again, it's called the iteration, so... Uh, their Golgothic alphabet, you probably could not take that and read modern Ukrainian, but that is the origin of uh, the Ukrainian alphabet. Trace all the way back to the extraordinary cultural influence of Cyril Methodius uh, in the lands of Eastern Europe and Ukraine specifically. There's a depiction of Cyril Methodius, and you see them holding up an early version of the Golgothic script. And uh, that church on the right would be built initially during the, the reign of Vladimir, um, who had converted to Christianity, again, reawakening Christianity in the lands of, of what is Ukraine. And following that, this great uh, cathedral is constructed. Uh, St. Sophia today is one of the great landmarks of Kiev uh, and a proud part of Ukraine history. It's been damaged over the centuries, so this is a... a 
it's been worked on. <laughs> so it's not in exactly the shape it would have been when initially constructed, but it is probably the single most important, I'll be careful here, one of the most important churches, well, I'll be safe, one of the most important churches today in the, in the Ukraine, a site of tremendous importance. You'll even see this, by the way, um, in the Winter on Fire video you guys watch for class currently. You'll see this uh, cathedral there in the background of some of the scenes as one of the most important houses, places of worship, and spiritual significance in Ukraine because it, again, dates all the way to the time period of the reintroduction of Christianity and the profound change that brings with to the lands of Ukraine. I mentioned the Crimean Peninsula being the first kind of contact point with Byzantium uh, and that church there you see on the left, kind of in ruins, which are depicted right here, um, is perhaps the first place where Eastern Slavic Christianity was born because Cyril Methodius might have arrived there first and then traveled out there and that, that church being constructed there is I mean, going to be ground zero for reintroduction of Christianity to Ukraine. On the right, you see a procession there for Cyril Methodius. You can see the priest there uh, carrying the portraits of the two gentlemen. And the picture there of uh, Prince Vladimir, although you see Vladimir, right? And this is the Russian, because by, by the way, because Russia, in this part of what I just told you, Russia will agree with all that I said. That's this joint history, because we're still talking about Rus, right? Rus is the origin to, of what today would be Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. So... Now, again, the Russians refer to Vladimir as Vladimir. So when you Google him on Wikipedia, you probably have shared numbers that come up with Vladimir. But uh, Ukrainians will call him Vladimir. Exact same individual, of course, just simply uh, the language differentiation in the name they des described to him. And you see him to being uh, baptized. Again, an epical moment in the history of Ukraine being transformed into a Christian nation, becoming part of the Christian West. Now, let me highlight this for you guys, too. Give me a minute here. There we go. Okay. After Vladimir, after his death, Kievan Rus is going to go increasingly into significant struggles, um, in part because Kievan Rus is quite large, you guys know. It's a very large realm or kingdom. And it's not easy in the best times in the modern world necessarily to keep a central authority over that. And certainly the rulers in Kiev struggle to do that. And in some ways begin to fail to do that because it is so big. There's a variety of uh, Kievan princes, or actually the Rurik would be the, actually their, their kind of family line. Remember, these are from Scandinavia. So think back, actually we're from Sweden probably more specifically. So really you still have by heritage Swedish princes and that'd be Vladimir or Vladimir, who are ruling the land, lands of, of Rus. And they'd still, by the way, they still have a connection, even this era, with their, their ancestral homeland, which would be actually Sweden. But they're ruling Rus, and there's an increasing power struggles as important cities and realms of power in Kievan Rus begin to struggle for autonomy or supremacy over the others. And so Kievan Rus begins to fragment and weaken. And in the context of all that, a number of important power centers are going to develop. And you don't need to write all this down. I want you guys to get lost in this complexity. But uh, but let me look and show you a map here. So this map right here, which you guys are looking at, this is part of the realm of Kievan Rus right here, which you see, is, again, it's quite large. There's a Crimean Peninsula right there, and you can see Kiev right here. So Kiev is at least, in theory, the center of all this. But in practicality, you have other power centers ruled by different princes. They have their own armies. They're in competition. And they begin to carve out their own independent realms, struggling for, again, autonomy and, or sometimes supremacy. So the important ones for you guys to know, again, I don't, we don't go too deep a dive into this, but would be this region you guys see right here, which is kind of pinkish and purple area. Uh, and that is going to be, here we go. Vladimir Suzdal. Now, why the significance of that kingdom there? That kingdom is going to lead eventually to, on the fly here, I'm editing a little bit, <laughs> uh, early Muscovy or be ancestor of today's modern Russia. So, this, but this is a really important point. So, Kievan, Kievan Rus is in, in the process of fragmenting and those fragments explain a lot of our current world. Now, again, there's much of the story that complicates it down the road. But 
kind of the origin story to some degree of the, the different national groups you see today is in part coming out of the remains of the Kievan roots. So Vladimir Suzdal, as I mentioned right here, will eventually turn into, again, there's more of that story. It's a more complicated story than this, but it will be an important origin of what today's modern-day Russia. Think Moscow and so forth. I'm going to skip uh, Belarus because Belarus is a much smaller piece of the story and to keep things simple for you guys. But in Western Rus, there's a princi principality called Galicia Volinia. And that's going to play a very important role in today the survival and uh, beginning of, of nationalist origin and nation building projects, which lead eventually into modern day Ukrainian nationalism. Now, Volinia Galicia, let me show you the map again is not a particularly large part of what is today currently contemporary Ukraine. It's relatively small, but it's in the western portion. And I don't want to go too far ahead, but the, this western portion will be probably the single most important part of Ukraine to be able to hold on to uh, a greater ability to express your hopes for Ukrainian statehood. Other parts of Ukraine will also have that too, but just by the contingencies of history and the empire that the Galicia Volinia will be absorbed into, the nature's empires will allow a greater spark of a hope for Ukrainian national identity to remain alive, even though, again, for centuries and centuries following the, the destruction of the Kievan Rus, there is no, what we would say, Ukraine per se as a nation state or a kingdom, really. But... It's in Galatia Volinia, which you guys can see here. There we go. This region here, western portion, the very western portion of Ukraine, that uh, that they're able to more strongly than any other area of contemporary Ukraine uh, to hold on to the aspirations and the early formation of what today would be a modern Ukrainian state. Now that's, of course, down the road. In the short run, just epic disaster strikes. And it's a strike, as you guys know, from much of uh, Asia and in this, into the Middle East, the Islamic empires, and then all the way into Eastern Europe, which is a devastating Mon series of Mongol invasions. And in the context of Kievan Rus, the disaster befells them in 1240 when a massive Mongol ar army arrives outside the wooden stone walls of Kiev, the capital of Rus, and eventually they're able to battle the way into the city and massacre much of the population. If you see a depiction here in this diorama right there, you can see in the background, you might recognize that cathedral, that'd be St. Sophia. Which, by the way, ironically, the Mongols did not destroy it. Now, they certainly looted it and would damage it, but they did not destroy St. Sophia as they killed and massacred many of the residents of Kiev. But, but Kiev does not disappear. It's very badly damaged. The, the kingdom of the Kievan Rus is over. There's only ashes of that. But the people, the Slavs and others who would make up Kievan Rus, although many, of course, are killed, and we have accounts of uh, travelers from Byzantium passing through this region and saying, seeing skeletons and skulls littering the countryside. So, of course, there's a very high death toll. But the population, though, is going to recover over time, even though Kievan Rus is done. But you can't underestimate the tremendous trauma and blood loss uh, the loss of lives in the Mongol invasion of Kievan Rus and just the utter disaster for many of those. Um, and will not be the first time, by the way, of course, that the lands of Ukraine are going to go through a cataclysmic, a cataclysmic uh, invasion by one group or another. The Mongols will certainly be probably, probably the worst, although the Huns did a terrible damage too. This is a depiction then, again, of course, of the Mongols defeating the forces of Rus. Let me show you this map right here. So following that, the Mongols are going to pull back a bit in a sense. And eventually the Mongols, because of succession struggles, which maybe you guys are familiar with, the Mongols themselves will fragment into various Mongol kingdoms. The one in the context of our class we want to know about is called the Golden Horde. And you can see them depicted here in this map. They're going to play a major role in Ukrainian history, Russian history as well, too. But... Out of the ashes of this, you have various kingdoms that the Mongols allow to function as mm, treaty states under Mongol control. One of these would be uh, 
Vladimir Suzov, which you see right here, eventually there'll be Moscow, will eventually gradually emerge as under Mongol control, or the Golden Horde, as we all try the Golden Horde, and they're paying taxes to the Golden Horde. But the Golden Horde did allow them to some degree, I wouldn't say autonomy, but some degree of ability to manage their own internal affairs, as long as they're paying taxes, recognizing the ultimate suzerainty of the Golden Horde, and the parts of Ukraine that would experience that too. But the Russian parts, in this case Muscovy, or the, the remains of Vladimir Suzdal, have a much more direct Mongol control over them than Western parts of today would be Ukraine. Uh, and that's important, and I'm not, I don't go into that, I just say, but the Mongol hand is lighter in Western Ukraine. Now, again, we're, we're doing a high speed, a high speed run through all this. So uh, we, we could go into much deeper, but uh, I want to try to make it um, digestible for you guys. So, uh, so <clears throat> once the, the disaster and the, the nightmare of the Mongol initial invasion settles down, um, Ukraine for the next, you guys see that, what, 400 years is going to be, uh, the subject of the of a divided contested territory between more powerful competing empires and each one of these could be an individual lecture and if you guys go on to youtube and watch timothy snyder he will spend almost a lecture on each one of these <laughs> uh and they're fascinating i recommend that you guys i'm not i'm not jealous i recommend that timothy snyder history of ukraine he'll go in a deep dive um but for our class, we're talking 20th century Europe, so we cannot do a deep dive. It's going to be a shallow walk in the pool up to your ankles, <laughs> but still helpful. All right, so let me give you a minute here, and oh, let me highlight this for you guys. There we go. So Ukraine is going to find itself at the, at the, at the crossroad or the borderlands between more powerful competing um, empires, kingdoms, nations, and the, the, the geographic region in Ukraine is going to be prey to all that. So what are these? And this would be the Golden Horde, successor to the group of Mongols that conquered uh, Kievan Rus. Eventually, the Golden Horde will break up even a little bit more. And you have the Crimean Khanate, which you see right here. And this map here on the right, there's a Crimean Khanate right there. And you can see the Golden Horde is just, just to the left. By the way, they are related to each other. Both of them are brought up by the Mongols, but they're... The leadership is really different. Sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they're antagonistic with each other. Um, then you have the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Let me show you that map here on the left. And that is the very powerful influence of Duchy of Lithuania, or later on we can say Polish and Poland. And that they'll grow quite powerful during this time period. You can see there on the map here on the left. And you can see the Poland Lithuania are going to control much of East, Central Eastern Europe. Um, including much of the lands uh, which today would be a Ukraine, although not the supposed southern port, which is controlled by the Crimea Khanate. And you can see uh, the early formation of Russia here on the right. At the same time, eventually, the Ottoman Empire, this will be later, is going to emerge as a great uh, powerhouse and a powerful Islamic kingdom, and they'll extend themselves all the way into Eastern Europe. You see right here, Again, taking control of parts of today would be um, a Ukraine, almost to Kiev. You see Kiev is just above the, the, the farthest reach of the Ottoman Empire. But the Ottoman Empire controls the southern portions of what today is Ukraine, including the Crimean Peninsula, um, taking over from the Crimean Khanate. Although, actually, the Crimean Khanate continues, but under the, the overall sovereignty of the Ottoman Empire. Even the Crimean Khanate is still, to some degree, somewhat autonomous. But they're, they're, in this case, instead of owing allegiance to perhaps the, the Mongol rule much farther to the east in Asia, now they're a client state of the Ottoman Empire. But again, Ukraine, where's Ukraine on the map here? We can see ge geographically where it is, but as an independent national entity, no longer exists. Now, the people are there. And that, but and by, this also just shows you how complicated aspects of Korean, uh, Ukrainian history is. That you have all these various kingdoms who at various times control parts of the lands of Ukraine. And each one of these is going to impact on who eventually uh, Ukrainian people will turn out to be. It's a very complex cultural, ethnic, religious background. Korean, Crimean Khanate is going to convert to Islam, for example. 
<clears throat> Poland, Lithuania, as we primarily say, would be say Catholic, whereas the rest of uh, these regions, Russia, for example, is going to be Russian Orthodox, uh, with a connection to uh, ultimately to Byzantium uh, Greek Orthodox Church. Now, I want to get to the end of this lecture, <laughs> and we're, we're returning to a very important moment because you see, the last four hundred years, there is no even shadow state that today we could call Ukraine. Uh, the lands there, the Slavic people are there, but they are, because of war kind of changes and struggles over power, they are the playthings, vulnerable is a whole series, these greater powers are controlling the lands we know as Ukraine. Perhaps Ukrainian even identity, the remains of Kievan Rus would have been totally washed away in a sense, but and this is a very important part. There's a reemergence and a very, very significant one that's very important today in Ukraine currently, and that is the emergence of what's called the Cossack state. Perhaps you guys have heard of the Cossacks. And in this case, we call the Hetnamit, the origins of the Ukrainian fatherland or homeland. And so following the disaster, the destruction of Kievan Rus, as you guys know, you have hundreds of years go by. Any aspirations, perhaps, of a separate identity is not possible. Maybe it's still held in the hearts of some Slavic peoples in these regions, but they're just they're trying to survive. But the Cossacks are going to form, I wouldn't really say an independent state, that'd be the wrong way to say it, really, but a hopeful homeland and a unique identity centered in the lands of Ukraine that reawakens the concept of this is our homeland and this is who we are, this is our people, and we want to have a free, independent nation amidst the sea of competing greater powers. But this, this is our homeland, and we want to be able to break away from the yoke of these various competing empires around us. And the Cossack Hetman would last from 1648 to 1764. Again, this is a big topic. I would like to go into deep dive in the Cossack Hetman. It's fascinating, and the Cossacks in general. But we're going to do the a relatively brief version. But this absolutely be on the exam. It's so important. Let me help you guys here. Let me highlight that for you guys. Okay. And uh, you guys are already familiar with Taras Shevinko. You heard it quite a bit him in a previous lecture. Here he, he emerges again. Again, as this really the father of modern Ukrainian literature and a major voice in Ukrainian national national identity and who they are. And a poem from him, he writes, whether all the Cossacks, whether the red coats, whether our good fortune, and whether blessed freedom. Now in this case, Taras Shevinko himself be a descendant of, of Cossacks is looking back an era when he is under Russian control, as you guys know well, and but lamenting that his homeland back in the earlier age, had, had a, a brief burst, a, a sunrise of, of hopeful nationhood and freedom to be have a, their own independent destiny and away from the controlling, exploiting colonial powers that were around Ukraine. Now, again, you, the Cossacks never really had a completely independent state, never quite that simple, although maybe some brief moments in a sense they did have some small independent states. Now, who are the Cossacks? By the way, it's a rough transition there. But, so who are the Cossacks? The Cossacks have a, kind of have a, have a complicated origin in a sense. But this is a wonderful kind of painting of the Cossacks, in this case, writing a letter to the Sultan of Turkey. And you can see they're drinking. They're having a good time. Probably joking as they're writing a letter to the Sultan of Turkey. And this is a wonderful kind of Ukrainian national, I guess, Maybe in our Western American context, to think of the Cossacks would be like, um, I guess maybe cowboys in the wild, wild west. I guess that's how you had to think of them. And good, the good cowboys. The good cowboys who are wearing the white hats, although they can wear with black hats sometimes too. <laughs> but the, the cowboys who are protecting you from the marauding, well, actually, it wouldn't work exactly because the Indians are, are the local indigenous people too. They're being colonized. So maybe the cat cowboy part doesn't work exactly, except that being mobile, horseback, kind of living maybe a wilder side of life, being able to protect you and yours um, against outside threats. That part is very good for understanding who the Cossacks are. Now, again, I don't look at our cowboys because cowboys sometimes are battle Indians and others. The Indians I have a separate category because Indians, that's their homeland too. 
uh, the Cossacks is different. They're battling these greater empires around them that, that Ukraine is not really their homeland, although there's exceptions to that too, but then generally not their homeland, and the Cossacks are battling to protect their people, their wives, their children, their families, their communities from more powerful competing outside forces and somehow trying to forge the safe community of freedom. So, the primarily, who are these people? So they are predominantly uh, Eastern Slavic Orthodox people originating in primarily the areas we would say today is Ukraine. They are semi-nomadic initially, semi-militarized, which means they're armed, but from at least in the early history, they weren't probably universally armed as a standardized army. It's kind of like bring your own weapon to some extent. Now, later on, they would become much more standardized, but as early as, again, maybe cowboys, in this case, would be a good analogy. Um, but they're they're hoping to have an independent state of one kind of the, some degree of self-government. Um, but again, being relatively small and weak, in reality, oftentimes they have to work with the larger powers around them. In fact, sometimes they serve as, as essentially as a, an ally or a mercenary force to large empires around them, and they're constantly forced to play off these greater powers around them who are steadily seeking to absorb the lands of Ukraine into their expanding kingdoms. And at times they do. And the, so the Cossacks are hoping to be able to navigate between these larger kind of whales, almost like this dolphin between whales, trying to navigate between these large whales which are seeking to crush it or absorb it. Um, and they're trying to play one off against another. Sometimes working for this one, sometimes working for that one. The, the goal, of course, is to remain free and be who they are. The Cossacks also tended to be a, a bit more egalitarian than the more feudalistic societies around them. Now, I'm not saying the Cossacks don't have class and hierarchy. They did, too. But part of the Cossack mentality, and this little bit cowboy analogy, too, is they don't like a hierarchy dictating who they are and what they do. They're actually a foreign hierarchy. These the imperial powers around them. And so whether that be Pol the Polish land classes who are using Ukrainian peasants as their workers or, or the Russians or the Crimean Khanate, these outside forces looking to exploit and abuse, as they would see it, the peoples of Ukraine, and the Cossacks are trying to limit or stop that as they're navigating this very complex uh, power struggle that is all around them. Let me show you a map right here so you can see what I'm talking about here. So this map right here shows you the, the massive Russian Empire, which is steadily getting large in this time period. You can see the Crimean Khanate here in this, I guess that's pink. <laughs> and then you can see the Polish Lithuanian forces, and then you see this area, which you guys see in purple. That's the Cossack Hetman, the Zaporizhian Cossacks. And this the year, this will be 1751. And they're trying, they're struggling to man, maintain some degree of independence. And to some degree, for a while, they do have it, although it's always very tenuous um, and under threat. And oftentimes, again, they have to work very closely with one or another as they're playing off these, these powerful kingdoms around them, which they're surrounded by. You see, they're surrounded there, right? On all sides, they have hostile uh, imperial societies threatening their existence. So let me give you a, a further example of this. And by the way, this is the complexity of history sometimes... Uh, uh, we're not as aware of in the United States because this is not as focused as our history. We tend to be very micro or navel gazing their own national experience. So let me explain uh, uh, something that's not me not so well known here. But when we think of slavery in American history, we think it was a binary, the black white experience. The Af enslaved African peoples brought to the new world. Sometimes we pause and we think, well, yep, there was slavery among the native peoples of Americas. Absolutely there was, for example, the Aztec Empire. So slavery was endemic in the Americas prior to the arrival of the Europeans. The Europeans did not introduce an institution that had no precedent in the Americas. Slavery already existed. Now, but still, in the, in the national story of America, obviously, the enslavement of people of African ancestry uh, has played a, a horrific and terrible role in American history. And sometimes we imagine that is the dichotomy of slavery. It's a, a European exploitation of Africans. And that is certainly a chapter in that sad human experience. But there are many others, and this is a good example. I want you guys to know this one. So the Crimean Khanate 
there. And again, would be primarily in the Craven Peninsula and areas around there. Um, very aggressively for hundreds of years raided into today the lands of what would be north, uh, central Ukraine, northern Ukraine, into uh, Western Russia as well to enslave raid. <coughs> and collected massive numbers of, of again, primarily Slavic peoples or villages, villages and so forth, who are caught up in this vast Tartar dragnet of slaving expeditions, brought down to Crimea, and then sold as slaves throughout the Islamic dynasties, later on the Ottoman Empire, and also even into the into North Africa and so forth. Uh, the Venetians are a big part of this. If you have the history of Venice, Venice, that amazing city there in Italy, the Venetians are big slave traders. Maybe that's, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but they're big slave traders. So that beautiful city of Venice was built on many products, but some of that would be Slavic slaves because Venetians were a big part of that slave trade. And the artwork you see in front of you is depicting some of these slave markets. The one that left, you can see Hagia Sophia there in the background, uh, now converted into a mosque under the Ottoman Empire. And it's a little hard to see here, but you can see some Ottoman men right here. And then you can see, in this case, these likely are Slavic women who've been seized, what could be from Ukraine or from Western Russia, and then brought all the way to Ottoman Empire. This could be a Istanbul, for example, and they're being sold as slaves. By the way, this African gentleman from Iraq is also a, a likely a slave, although his origin story ultimately would be obviously from probably the east coast of Africa or from North Africa. And then the picture on the right, again, this is a little bit of Orientalist fantasy, the painter who made this, but depicting a young Slavic woman who's being caught a slave. Now she's being sold as slave in the Islamic world. Um, and even though that painting might have a little bit of an or, or, Orientalist twist to it, and that's a whole other class, by the way. That's kind of the Western fantasy of uh, the the Ottoman exotic or the Eastern world, and our putting our kind of Western romantic, salacious fantasies onto that. But there's also a reality because the numbers there are massive, and that's one you guys know. So, the store, our historian Shirai Polki, this gentleman right here. <laughs> And my, my apologies if I'm not pronouncing his name correctly to him, because I'm relying heavily on him, um, estimates anywhere from 1.5 to 3 million Ukrainians and Russians are enslaved in the 16th, 17th centuries by the Crimean Tartars. You see the numbers there are massive. Um, and that slave trade has all the horror in many ways of our slavery too. Now, there will be some different aspects to it. Um, every slave society has different aspects to it, some better, maybe some worse. Uh, but that is a big national scar for Ukraine. Uh, I let me give you one example, and I want you guys to know this one. So uh, the most famous, at least it's certainly in the Western world, probably in, this, in the Ottoman world too, uh, the most famous empress in Ottoman history was actually a Ukrainian girl seized as a young girl, as a slave, and brought into a um, world she was young smart and beautiful eventually she gets put into the into the harem of the greatest of all the ottoman uh uh <coughs> sultans suleiman magnificent who you see depicted in the middle eventually as as one of his concubines in his uh, harem um something about her her beauty she had red hair which would be very unique obviously in the, in the islamic world um she's highly intelligent beautiful uh she apparently is a very talented poet and he was loved poetry too at some point, uh, he, he elevates her from being a concubine into an empress, and she becomes uh, his most important of all his wives and becomes, uh, to this day, an icon and the most famous of all the sultan's wives of really all generations because of who it was, her husband being Suleiman the Magnificent, the most powerful of all the, sult of all the uh, Ottoman Turkish sultans. And she becomes a part of that. And that's a whole separate class, too, on the Ottomans, Ottomans and Roxolana and her story. Um, but she's Ukrainian. Her origin is Ukrainian. She's enslaved as a young girl. On the right there, you see a depiction of her, Natasha, and her hometown in what today would be Ukraine before she was abducted in a slave raid and taken into the Ottoman world. Yeah. So this this terrible national scar and scourge on central Ukraine and the Slavic people, the Cossacks are going to be the heroes in this because the Cossacks emerge in, in part to try to limit, protect, stop, and even more amazing, rescue 
I'm, I'm sure it's not last, rescue uh, the friends, neighbors, husbands, wives, daughters, sons who have been captured by Crimean Tartars and the, the Cossacks uh, in the best of the moments being able to ride to the rescue. For example, even raiding into the Crimea itself, sometimes even by sea, to try to rescue and bring back uh, their fellow, I guess citizens, I don't know if it's citizens because they're not really the same country per se in these initial time period, but certainly friends and fellow, um, will you citizens, to protect them and to rescue them in the best of moments. That painting there is depicting that right there. These are Cossacks right here. These cuts right here, and then they're in combat with these uh, Crimean Tartars. There's again the depiction of the, in this case, uh, Kiev being a, becoming a, again an important center of the uh, Cossack kingdom during the height of its powers. And we're getting close to the end of this lecture. I want to get to the last couple things here before we leave the, the Cossacks and the Cossack so I want to give you a couple kind of biographical examples of what we're talking about. And I want another kind of a way marker in this aspirations of the people of, of Ukraine for a Ukrainian nationhood and independence. And that would be the last of the Cossack hetman who's struggling to find some kind of way to maintain independent national existence. And that would be Ivan Mazepa. And let me highlight that for you guys. Hopefully, my computer's not work, helping me here. Okay, there we go. There you go, Ivan Mazepa. And you can see his life, 1639-79. So, Isaac Mazepa is struggling mightily to protect what they have, which would be the Cossack Hetman, even in the this completing these whales, again, around the dolphin, to use that analogy again, to try to swim and maintain an ability to be an independent, free people amidst that. Mazepa will become a great Ukrainian hero down to today. Uh, there's a depiction of him. Now, by this time period, the the kind of the the good go, good guy, bad guy, uh, Cossack, wild men, cowboys <laughs> of the earlier generation have given away to uh, an increasingly well-educated, sophisticated, urbanized at least a leadership elite who are well educated, familiar many languages, and very used to navigating in the increasingly modern world of the beginning of a scientific revolution, uh, even touching a bit into enlightenment. And there's Isaac, Miz, uh, Ivan Mazepa there on the left. There's a contemporary depiction of him, um, Mazepa in Ukraine today, there on the right. So, what is it about him? Now, again, on the one hand, it's a sad part because at the end of his life, the Cossack Hetman is going to, for all practical purposes, be close to being extinguished. Not technically yet, but getting getting close to that. But he, seeing this struggle, is going to try to find a way to preserve this uh, Cossack independence amidst this very difficult situation. Again, and would view this as being a Ukrainian nationalist. Before, tragically, the ultimate failure of that attempt and Ukraine will be increasingly be annexed into Russia, and Russia will begin to refer to today we know Ukraine as Little Russia. We'll come back to that term later, but that Little Russia is traditional Russia referring to their expansion and colonization of the lands of Ukraine and trying to create this narrative that this has always been part of Russia, going back to the Rus, and now we're simply reabsorbing this part. Putin, by the way, obviously Vladimir Putin would love that analogy seeing Ukraine. In fact, if you ask him, is Ukraine an independent nation? He said it never has been and it is not now, despite the West you know, working against us. So just very briefly, Isaac, I mean, Ivan Mazepa, he has a very dramatic life story. I'm just going to mention one or two highlights and we're going to have to move on. But allegedly, as a young man, he falls in love with a, a Polish princess. They have an affair. Uh, in this case, Poland, Poland, Lithuania controlled much of what is today Ukraine. Um, he eventually is caught, and they consider him being a Cossack, which he is, that that's not okay for him to do that. And in their anger and rage toward him, they strip him naked, tie him to a horse in his cold conditions uh, in the winter, and release him, thinking the horse will ride out, run out into the wild, and of course he will suffer and eventually freeze to death in this frigid weather. You see that, that, that this very dramatic story being depicted on the left. 
of Mazeppa being tied to his horse, naked, and released in the wild, presuming the horse will run wild again, he will, with public exposure, that he'll suffer and die tied to his horse, he cannot free himself. Now, according to the narrative of his life, he is fortunately rescued by some fellow Cossacks who are aligned with Russia. Now, the Cossack kingdom, depending on where you are, east or west or north or south, at various times is working with or employed by sometimes the Russians, sometimes the Poles, sometimes the Ukrainian continents. Oftentimes the Ukrainians are hired, or Ukrainians, <laughs> but they are Ukrainians. The Cossacks are hired to fight for one side or another against the other. So, for example, the, the Cossacks often are used as soldiers by the Polish Lithuanian kingdom to protect them against raid from the Tartars. At various times, by the way, some southern Cossacks will align with the Tartars feeling that that's in their interest at the time of. Again, the, the Cossack state being the weakest of these, it's constantly having to jockey and find out which one of these empires do we need to align with for the time being, maybe temporary, because that's our, that's our best chance to survival at this moment. In any case, so Mazeppa is rescued by some Russian-aligned Cossacks, and they rescue him. You see depicted on the horse, and they save his life. Eventually, he falls, but not surprisingly, because he's been rescued. Instead, by the Polish part of Ukraine, controlled by the Polish-Lithuanian kingdom, he's rescued by some Cossacks who are uh, connected to Moscow. And not surprisingly, he uh, drifts into, once he revives and survives, and apparently got some clothes, clothes <laughs> Uh, and he becomes an increasingly important uh, leader in the eastern portion of the lands of Ukraine and the Cossack Kingdom aligned with Russia. But I mentioned all those are simply marriages of convenience. Uh, Mazeppa does not want to be a part of little Russia. He does not want to the Cossack Hetman be absorbed uh, into Russian culture and for the whole idea of an independent nation, people, culture, identity to simply be washed away. So he's looking for a way to try to preserve this independent Ukrainian state, even though he's been working close with the Russians for a while because he has to. But then again, we in, you, the lands of Ukraine, in this case, Cossack Hetman enters in, 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 into one more turn of the wheel of complexity of new forces aligning themselves and the, the Cossacks looking for a ray of sunshine. Again, surrounded, we'll go back to the dolphin analogy. The dolphin and the, these whales and a new whale arrives on the scene and Mazeppa feels this new whale, in this case it's Sweden, we haven't talked about Sweden yet, but Sweden in an expansive war against Russia and seeing that Mazeppa feels that maybe the Swedes who do not really have territorial aspirations on the Ukrainian Cossack Hetmet that maybe the Swedes will provide a window of opportunity to cast off the Russian yoke. So even though Mazeppa has been working with the Russians, seemingly loyal to the Russians, fighting for the Russians, he's close to Peter the Great. But again, his ultimate goal is, and again, in the Ukrainian historians say, his the burning flame of Ukrainian nation within him, those are simply marriages of convenience. Now that the Sweden and Russia go into this terrible war, that Mazeppa's like, maybe this will allow us to spring free and free us from the yoke of Russian imperialism. Now, tragically for the course of Ukraine, um, it worked for a time, but eventually the, the Swedish army, along with Mazeppa's Cossack uh, army who joined the Swedes, um, they're going to fight the, what's called the Battle of Potova in 1709. And tragically for the Swedes, but for our heroes in the story, uh, the Cossacks, they're going to lose that battle against the Russians and be defeated. Significance of that, of course, is that Mazeppa's hopes to free himself and free, above all, the lands of the Cossack Hetman or Ukraine from Russian control are going to be dashed in a disastrous defeat at the hands of the Russians. And let me highlight that for you guys. It's a dark day for Ukrainian national aspirations, but it's also a glorious moment because you see what they're trying to do. It, it's a failed attempt at freedom. But the fact that they're trying makes Mazepa to this day a great hero within Ukraine because he's doing his best, but he doesn't have a lot of cards to play. The Cossack kingdom is not big enough to take on Russia by itself. It's not possible. So again, sort of maneuvering, desperately trying to look for a way out. 
Now, I mentioned again, Ukraine fallen prey to these greater foreign powers. And that's the Great Northern War. And this is Ukraine caught again in the middle between powers. That is Peter the Great, one of the great Russian rulers or czars there on the left. And that gentleman on the right, which you probably don't know, but that would be Charles the Twelfth of Sweden. He's a great military leader too, and him and Peter the Great are struggling for who's going to be the dominant big dog in North, Central, Eastern Europe. Um, for a time, it's hard to imagine today Sweden taking on Russia by itself, but Sweden was a great military power. Charles the Twelfth was a brilliant military uh, general, and for a time the Swedes did quite well. Defeated Russia in a series of great battles. But as you guys know, ultimately, probably Russian numbers and Russia also going to modernize under Peter the Great. Ultimately, Peter the Great's forces will triumph against Charles XII. And that means, of course, uh, disaster for the Ukrainian, Ukrainians and for Mazeppa himself. This painting, and this will be the last thing we do in this lecture because we're about done for today, depicts, again, a very disastrous moment. Now, this is... Uh, going to be a Swedish painting. It shows Charles XII, who is not well following his battle. I think he was sick. That's following the Battle of Potova. They've lost. You can see his Swedish forces here in the background, and that is Charles XII there, not doing well. But this man leaned over him, pointing that is Mazeppa, his ally, his Ukrainian Cossack ally in the fighting. Um, the battle went so bad that actually Mazeppa and uh, Charles XII had to flee, and both went to flee into the Crimean Connet. <laughs> and seek refuge there. And the Crimean continent was like, well, we're not really aligned with you guys, but we're also not, we're worried about the Russians too. Eventually, Charles XII would eventually get back to Sweden after a lot of work and paying quite a bit of money to get out of the Crimean control. But the fact that that's what takes place, I should let you know, again, our, the, the Cossacks, that dolphin and then whales have been maneuvering, but finally the whale, in this case Russia, is going to emerge triumphant and is going to swallow the Cossack cabinet. But we'll get to that story, though, and Catherine the Great, but that'll be in the next lecture because that's the end for this one. So I hope all of you guys are well. Uh, there's much more to this story. I wish we'd go in more detail, but that's all the detail we have until our next installment of Ukrainian a national story. I encourage you guys to Google these people. It's a fascinating history. And again, it's, it's almost like opening a, a Russian doll. <laughs> and there's story after story after story of these larger narratives taking place and opens up all kind of avenues of Eastern European history too. Polish history, Swedish history, obviously Russian history, the Ottoman Empire, other places in Eastern Europe as well too, not to mention, of course, the focus of our study right now, which is uh, the history of Ukraine. So with that, until next one, everybody, wish you guys well. Take care, everybody.